It's January 3rd, 2009. This is Maximize Utility. Today I want to talk a little bit about the English newspaper, The Economist. I've been reading this financial and economic uh, news weekly since about 1980, when I was about 20 years old. and I've read it pretty much every issue since then. I would say that this publication has had more effect on my intellectual development than probably any other single source. Yet I'm going to sit here today and I'm going to somewhat denounce it and criticize it. Now, I know you're not supposed to criticize the media, blame the media, that, that their job is to report things and they're going to from time to time get things wrong. And I know it might seem like I'm making a lot of nitpicking criticisms, but I do think that the publication has deteriorated a lot. I started to read it in the 80s and I liked it and I think it was a pioneer in economic liberal thinking. And then in the 1990s I got to the point where I recommended it strongly to students I was teaching. But then I think it kind of turned. I think in particular what happened was that when economic liberalism was first coming along under Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan, the economist was there and was a pioneer in all that thinking. And it was in a sense its gift to the world and at that time most people would have been thinking government was the way to go. But now that everybody thinks in an economic free way, that the average truck driver out there knows that you're supposed to make private contracts to solve your problems, and they know that they've made choices, and they know that when the price of gas went up from a buck fifty to four dollars, they didn't cry that it was price gouging. They said, hey, that's the way the price mechanism goes. Now the economist is kind of picking up the rear. It's the economist that's advocating the government come in and do everything. It's the economist that denies that people can make private contracts to solve their problems. The economists would wail about that. They frequently say in their editorials and elsewhere in the publication how deeply they support economic freedom. But that's a tip-off. If you're saying that you support economic freedom all the time, maybe you're not really supporting economic freedom any longer. So I said that The Economist historically was a liberal-leaning uh, publication, but by liberal I mean free market. I mean libertarian or classical liberal. I don't mean liberal like having the government do things for you. That's just the opposite. So here's a piece from a 1993-94 issue. It's called Don't Bank on it. An editorial goes, there is a better, more liberal solution. Public holidays should be abolished. And the economist here is saying that rather than have the government pick our holidays for us, let people just pick their own holidays. So they give an example that the Chinese want to celebrate Chinese New Year. They'll take the day off and incur the cost. That's the kind of thing I would have liked in The Economist in the 1990s, that kind of liberal thinking. Again, I say liberal meaning free market, free choice. Now, contrast editorials from more recent years in The Economist. Here's one, work, work, work. It's all about how we're going to pay for the old. And it's all about how the government has to change taxes and create incentives. It's not simply, oh, let's leave the rules the way they are and let old people make contracts with private companies and other private parties. No, the government has to be there shaping this situation. Here's another editorial about women in the economy. And the story is that women can't get a fair shake in the economy. That a woman can't approach an employer and make a private contract and get a fair shake. So the government has to be helping women all along. Now I can tell these kinds of editorials, they wouldn't have gone that way in the 1980s at the old economist. Also, the editorial about uh, public holidays, that's something that today maybe the Boston Globe, a newspaper that is a left-leaning type of uh, newspaper, would say something like that today, whereas it might not have said it 20 years ago the way The Economist did, whereas the other editorials about helping women and helping the old with the government are things that you find in the Boston Globe just as much as you find them in The Economist. Here's a, a short piece on the aftermath of Hurricane Andrew in 2004. The Economist writes, Hurricane Andrew led to a spree of price gouging by petrol station owners and insurance agents. Now, if you're an economic liberal, you wouldn't call it price gouging. I repeat, you simply would not call it price gouging. You'd say either demand is high and supply is low, but whatever, whatever the price is, it's set so as to clear that market, and it makes economic sense. It's not price gouging. I say that that's something that the editors of The Economist in the 1980s and 1990s might not let get by. Here's something you see in The Economist all the time. And again, I think it's a tip-off that they've uh, given up their belief in economic liberalism. They say, quote, liberals, such as this newspaper, and if you're to the point where you're asserting that you have some kind of belief, then that belief might not really be there any longer. Let me, let me riffle through a bunch of things I think I've picked up on in The Economist. The Economist loves evolutionary biology. Remember, that's the science about why do people do what they do, 
It has to do with thousands and thousands of years of trying to propagate our species. So men like women of a certain shape because it implies that they're fertile. Anyway, I think The Economist picks up on too many of these stories. You see them all the time. They don't have that much scientific merit, but I simply think that the writers at The Economist find it titillating, so they like to bring it up. The Economist loves surveys. They use surveys all the time, even when the surveys don't seem that uh, reasonable. I'm looking at one, it says that over 40% of the people in America take the Bible literally. Well, if that were the case, then you'd think that over 40% of people in America would go to church at least once a week if they think they're going to have uh, eternal life somewhere, but they don't. I think they take the surveys way too seriously. The Economist loves international rankings and international comparisons. And sometimes it's important or useful to compare uh, Canada with Australia, for example. But sometimes the comparisons could be very misleading. Uh, for example, if you look at a part of the United States that looks like Sweden and compare it with Sweden, you'll probably find they're very similar. Whereas if you just compare the U.S. as a whole for, say, crime rate or average education with Sweden as a whole, you might not get something very useful. But The Economist, I think, looks at these rankings and comparisons uh, too loosely. The Economist buys into the culture wars in the U.S., the idea of the red and the blue states. On occasion, they'll debunk a stereotype or two about the same topic, but for the most part, they buy into the idea that we're at each other's throats. In my opinion, people are much more mellow today. There's much less tension between people of different political persuasions today than there was even when I was a kid in the 70s and in the 80s. I don't believe the culture wars one bit, but The Economist really buys into it. The Economist always characterizes Americans as very traumatized by events. We're always looking around at our society, pondering our society, wondering uh, if we're failing and why we're failing. For example, in 2003 there was a crash of a, uh, one of the U.S. space shuttles, and The Economist had us agonizing over it uh, for a long, long period of time. I mean, it was a tragic event, but I don't recall anybody really getting bummed out about it. Certainly after the first few days, uh, people knew nothing about it. Anyway, The Economist thinks that we're always traumatized and always comparing ourselves. But I think that's something that flies in the face of what I call maximized utility. That people don't really care about the national economy or the nationality. What they care about is their own little lives. We're not like the Germans of the 1930s, kind of looking around all the time about what our society is doing. And I think The Economist misses that. And I could go on and on about things I don't like about The Economist. I don't like the local coverage they do of the state of Massachusetts. It's something that I know really well. And then sometimes I'm suspicious of other coverage they do in places I don't know that well. But you might say, if I don't like it, well, why don't I act like a good um, microeconomic agent and stop uh, reading it? Because it's too good. And I even put the web page up there, www.economist.com. I would recommend subscribing to it if you're interested in things like maximize utility. Uh, let me say one more thing. I remember so many years ago I read an article in The Economist. It was about the level of voter participation. And the way they did it was they said, oh, the rate was X, 60% voted or something like that. And what are the pro and cons? And they riffled off the pros and they riffled off the cons. Oh, it's good that people don't vote because they're doing things of their own free will. And the cons were things like, oh, then they aren't taking part in the government. And then they said, but it's not an issue. And that's what I think is the right attitude. Now, of course, so if The Economist looked at everything like that, and they said, oh, this recent turmoil between Russia and Ukraine, oh, it's something that's been going on for 100 years, so it's not an issue, so we're not going to write an article on it, I realize they'd be giving away their franchise. So, as I said initially, you know, criticizing the press, there's a danger to it because they're just reporting stuff out there. I think The Economist has slipped a lot, and I think it's, it's a younger generation of writers and I don't think that they see freedom as their gift to the world, so they somewhat resent it. And I also just think they tend to go for too much pop culture. And But nonetheless, it is a good publication, and it does turn you on to the latest ideas in economics.